What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks or so, really the last like, you know, week and a half, something like that, ever since Bart Allen returned in DC Rebirth with Super Sons of Tomorrow. And the more I thought about it, the more I, I kind of came to this realization that with Bart Allen being so involved in like, you know, the Flash landscape, following Terminal Velocity, different things like that, and even the, the role that he played in the New 52, albeit kind of a reinvigoration of his character that a lot of fans didn't really care for, like a five minute expo in the middle of Super Sons is not really enough to offer a real explanation on Bart Allen. So we're gonna do a character discussion on him, which I kind of need to do because it's been a while since we've done one. Now, those of you guys who are really, really familiar with Bart Allen, uh, you're going to go crazy and you're going to be like, what? And you're, you're going to think I'm nuts when I tell you that Bart Allen's introduction into DC Comics is really part and parcel to the death of Superman. So for those of you guys who are new, when it comes to comic books, you have what are called paradigm shifts, which is to say the introduction or set of events that basically changes the entirety of the industry itself. Now, a lot of people will say that like Action Comics number one really changed the comic book industry but the industry didn't exist. Action Comics number one, Detective Comics number 27, Wiz Comics number two, the introductions basically of Superman, Batman, and Captain Marvel, the introduction of those characters really set the groundwork for what would become the comic book industry. But for me, the first major paradigm shift in comic books came in 1956 with the introduction of Barry Allen. And the reason why was because of the fact that following the end of World War II, comics just weren't that popular anymore, at least not superheroes. Instead, people wanted to reprieve from all the political stuff and all the fighting and different things like that. And they wanted to focus on, you know, crazy far out, sci-fi adventures, and so for the most part, science fiction was the name of the game. The introduction of Barry Allen took these sci-fi themes and blended them with superheroes, and it worked perfectly, because following the introduction of Barry Allen, suddenly the stage was set for this whole new era of comic books. Now, that ran up until what I would consider to be the next paradigm shift, which was the night Gwen Stacy died, which of course was basically this idea that a superhero could fail disastrously by virtue of his own inaction or his own recklessness. Of course, you know, 1985's uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, you know, the first major reboot by DC. See, the Dark Knight Returns, all these things really focus on these sort of shifts that help to, to evolve the comic book landscape. But one of the most important things to ever happen in the comic book industry was the death of Superman. And Max Landis did a really, really cool video about this, you know, the death and return of Superman. And one of the things that he talked about was that Superman dying and then coming back some six months to a year later basically killed death in comic books. Superman was the most popular superhero of all time. I mean, he's, you know, more recognizable than like religious figures. And so the idea is if the most popular superhero in the world can die, and come back, then why can't anybody else die and come back? And so suddenly you started seeing this massive explosion of superheroes who had previously been killed off, like Colossus, you know, who died during the end of the whole uh, legacy virus thing that stretched on for, you know, seven or eight years, who basically came back under Joss Whedon's run in 2004. You saw all these things going on with regards to these characters being killed and returning. But the reason why I say the introduction of Bart Allen is part and parcel to the death of Superman is because while Superman dying and then returning effectively killed the sales of action comics, what it did do is it just skyrocketed the sales of Superman at the time that people thought he was going to be gone forever. When the Flash comics were originally written after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is to say when Mike Barron and Bill Loeb took up the Flash title, for the most part, for the first however many issues that the publication lasted under their belt, it was really by and large this sort of series of stories where Wally West was quote unquote living under the shadow of Barry Allen. And it was pretty interesting because it sort of painted this picture of a lot of people who felt like they'd been overshadowed by relatives, different things like that. But in truth, the line of stories began to wear thin. And so what ended up happening is maybe some seven years after Crisis on Infinite Earths was written, writer Mark Wade took over the Flash title with issue number 62 and wrote this story called Born to Run. Now, Born to Run was really just kind of a retelling of Wally West's origin. It was basically a way for Mark Wade to come along and say, this is a fresh starting off point, not really a reboot so much as just a place for you to jump in and pick up everything that's going on. And over the course of Mark Wade's run when it came to Wally West, and we talked about this, you know, when Wally West explained, which you'll find down in the description, it was really kind of moving away from the, oh, he's living under the shadow of Barry, and instead focusing on growing the character of Wally West, saying, look, yeah, he's under the shadow of Barry Allen, but people don't want to see stories where he constantly struggles with that. They want to see what he can do on his own. And so Mark Wade was really kind of considered to be like the standard with the Flash writer. I mean, you go back and you look at all the runs of the Flash that have ever existed in the history of DC Comics, and most anybody will tell you Mark Wade's run is at the very top. It was groundbreaking in a lot of different ways. And one of these was because of the introduction of Bart Allen.
Now again, with this whole idea really feeding into the death of Superman, where DC looked around and saw the sales of action comics just kind of floundered following Superman's return because people felt tricked, they felt duped, DC really kind of learned not to pull the same gag twice. And so instead of actually killing off Wally West, what DC did is they kind of offered this red herring that maybe Wally West will die. And initially it all really started off with like zero hour crisis in time. And there was this really good interview where Mark Wade did where he talked about this idea that with zero hour crisis in time, DC had a lot of continuity issues that were left over after Crisis on Infinite Earths. For example, most characters after the first crisis basically got reboot stories within a year. I mean, you didn't really see or hear from them until they received a reboot. Like, you know, Superman was a really good example. And you got uh, John Byrne's Superman, the Man of Steel, which basically gave you this whole new origin for Superman's character in the post-crisis landscape. But you had characters like Hawkman, for example, who didn't get a new origin until three years after Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, yet he was still around. And so people kind of asked the question, well then, what's his new origin? Like, how do we reconcile this character who's basically hails from a universe that's not supposed to exist anymore. And so because there were all these different continuity issues, DC believed they could basically clear it up using Zero Hour Crisis in Time. And so during the Zero Hour Crisis in Time story, Wally West was effectively thrown into the time stream and ended up seeing a future where his love interest at the time, Linda Park, was basically going to die and he didn't know if there was a way to basically save her. And so this combined with the introduction of other things like the Speed Force and so on and so forth, effectively set the stage for the idea that Wally West was going to try to find a way to save Linda park and in the process effectively die. At the same time and probably some 30 issues after his inaugural run with issue number 92 back in 1994, Mark Wade sat down and came to this realization that if they were going to basically lead the entire reader base of the Flash comics to believe that Wally West was going to die, then it had to be convincing. And again, this is actually covered in a couple interviews that he's done. Tomorrow's Publishing, Secord Organization, ComicBook.com, different things like that. And you can usually look up Mark Wade interviews and find them for the most part. But the idea was they had to make it convincing. The issue they faced is that Wally West as a character was predicated on being Kid Flash, which is to say that as a young boy, he basically received his powers as the Flash in the exact same way Barry Allen did. And so Mark Wade kind of looked down and said, if we've been going through all these steps for, you know, some 30 issues or whatever it is to basically move Wally West away from the quote unquote Barry Allen archetype, then why would it make sense to introduce a new Kid Flash that follows in the exact same steps as Wally West? And so what Mark Wade ended up doing is in Flash Volume 2, issue number 92, he introduced the character Bart Allen. Now, Bart Allen's introduction actually came in a couple different ways, and it was really hot on the heels of the return of characters like Max Mercury, for example, who way back in the Silver Age was Quicksilver, but when he was reintroduced by Mark Wade, he was basically just called Max Mercury. It was hot off the heels of those characters basically popping back up, the idea that they were being reintroduced and kind of consolidating all the speedster information, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But what ended up happening here is there was basically a point whereby Iris West, really, you know, I guess Iris Allen, if that's what you want to call her, was in the 30th century. And of course, the reason for that is really outside of the scope of this video, but the fact remains that Bart Allen was introduced as the grandson of Barry Allen living in the 30th century. The problem with his character with regards to the DC landscape is that he was essentially stuck in hyper acceleration. And what this meant was that his body was physically aging faster than his mind as a result of the speed force. And so what ended up happening is Iris had this idea to send him back to the 20th century and see if there would be a way for Wally West to effectively fix him since there was really nobody alive at that point in time who was as adept with regards to like the speed force and how all that worked as Wally West was in the 20th century. And so, of course, the cool thing about this was that with the introduction of Bart Allen and effectively being this new quote-unquote Kid Flash, Mark Wade had to find a way to basically say, okay, if he's gonna be Kid Flash, we can't kill him off in six months because he's aged so fast. We gotta find a way to basically, you know, slow his aging down. And so essentially it was a story whereby Wally West had raced Bart Allen around the world and then essentially just kind of set his speed powers back to rights, meaning that he would age at a normal rate. And so what ended up happening is Mark Wade actually crafted this really, really, really really cool set of events leading up to terminal velocity in the Flash issue number 100. And over the course of these eight issues, it was essentially established that Wally West did not know how to handle Bart Allen. Bart Allen was reckless, that he was headstrong. He basically leaped before he looked. And it was a great way to grab the element of the 1990s teenager, you know, 1990s young kid, and throw it in there. Because a lot of kids love the idea of being impulsive and really living in the moment. It's just kind of a byproduct of being young. And so because Bart Allen was introduced as essentially this sort of in comic book stand-in for the nature of of what it meant to be a teenager in the 1990s and really a teenager in any era, readers immediately latched on to him. And in order to basically keep the character of Bart Allen going, absent the involvement of Wally West, what ended up happening here is Mark Wade took the character of Bart and made him a protege of Max Mercury. Now again, this really ran up until issue number 100. And the reason why was because of the fact that while Bart Allen was kind of a protege of Max Mercury following that, Terminal Velocity was essentially designed to be this sort of, you know, this is where it all ends, this is where Wally West dies. And of course it gave us like the whole 
origin of the speed force, you know, and all those different kinds of things. Now, the reason why that matters is because historically speaking, when it came to the various speedsters in DC comics, there really was no unifying factor in terms of how they got their powers. The only unifying factor was that they could all move really fast. Now, different people use their speed in different ways, but you look at someone like Johnny Chambers and Jesse Chambers, and it was a calculation that granted them their powers. You look at Wally West, he got his powers the exact same way as Barry Allen. Barry Allen got his powers by being doused in chemicals and struck by lightning at the same time. And so what ended up happening is Mark Wade sat down and crafted the speed force as effectively this other dimensional source of energy from which all speedsters gain their power. And so what he'd done is he looked at the characters of Jay Garrick all the way back in the Golden Age. He looked at the characters of Jesse Chambers, of Johnny Chambers. He looked at Max Mercury. He looked at Impulse, Wally West, Barry Allen, the whole nine yards. And what he essentially said is the means by which they gain their powers is still intact. Wally West was struck by lightning and doused in chemicals. Barry Allen, the exact same thing. Johnny and Jesse Chambers use a, a, a mathematical proof in order to access their powers. But what all these characters ended up doing was effectively tapping into the speed force. They just didn't know it at the time. And this really came by way of an expose from Max Mercury in the sense that in terms of the NDC universe chronology, Max Mercury was the first person to tap into the speed force, meaning he was basically the first person to realize it was there and to realize that was the source of their energy. Now, because of the fact that Max Mercury had been brought back, effectively became the sort of Zen master of the speedsters, whereas Jay Garrick was just old man Flash, the whole idea behind this was that he was put in the perfect position to be a mentor for Bart Allen. And so fans could quite literally read Bart Allen's stories and basically learn about him as a character as they read the stories, learn about how the Speed Force works, kind of have this sort of coming to age series. At the same time, and within a year after making his debut, well, really a, a few years after making his debut, because of the fact that Impulse was such a wildly popular character among young readers in the sense that kids in the mid nineties basically got their own version of the Kid Flash, he of course got his own solo series. And this ran for quite a little bit. I mean, it ran between 1995 all the way up to 2002, really running all the way up to issue number 89. But again, Mark Wade was like the main contributor for it. I mean, he had people who would be stand-in writers, you know, like Brian Augustine, different things like that. But of course, as we know, Mark Wade actually ended up leaving DC due to a fallout with Dan DiDio. And so the result was that he effectively walked away from a lot of the publications that were going on at the time. But the popularity of Impulse largely remained the same. And so what this meant was that over the course of his publication history with regards to the Impulse line of stories running between 1995 and 2002, there were a lot of crossovers, things like Our Worlds at War and Joker's Last Laugh and DC 1 Million, different things like that. Not only that, the solo series of Impulse, while he did cross over with The Flash, the solo series focused largely on himself in addition to Max Mercury and him basically receiving all this tutoring and training in terms of what it means to be a superhero, what his place is with regards to the power he has, how it relates to the Speed Force, seven things like that. The introduction of Thaddeus Thawne, for example, one of the main villains of Impulse, came out of his solo series. There were a lot of huge moments with regards to his character that were for the most part expanded. However, one of the most notable roles that Bart Allen played in the DC landscape was basically being one of the three superheroes who started Young Justice. Now, of course, Young Justice originally launched back in September, I think it was, of 1998, and it ran for about five years, running up until November 2003, which actually coincided with the relaunch of Teen Titans. But the funny thing about this was that, as far as I'm aware, between 1996 and 1998, Dan Jurgens was writing the Teen Titans, and the funny story about this was that Dan Jurgens wanted to bring Robin onto the Teen Titans in order to bolster the popularity of the team. The problem with this was that the Batman editor said no, and in truth, I have not been able to find any information that actually tells us as to why. Because of the fact that uh, Robin couldn't be used in Teen Titans, instead, Peter David grabbed the character alongside Connor Kent and Impulse and threw him in Young Justice. Now, there was a really cool interview that Peter David did with Tomorrow's Publishing, and one of the things that he said was that when it came to Young Justice, it was, in a lot of ways, testing the waters for something outside of Teen Titans. And the reason for this was because of the fact that the Teen Titans had really kind of hit their stride under the writing of Marv Wolfman, and they had never really achieved that level of popularity until the relaunch of Teen Titans going into the launch of the TV show. But up until that point, Marv Wolfman's run was a definitive run. And if they were going into the post-zero hour crisis in time landscape, while Teen Titans wasn't necessarily the worst idea, the idea was to try something new, to basically experiment with something that had been different from what had been seen before. Now, introducing Impulse onto Young Justice was huge because not only did you have his own solo series, you also had characters like Connor Kent, who had basically just kind of been a free-floating entity ever since he stopped being the Metropolis Kid during Reign of the Superman. He was one of those characters that DC never really knew what to do with. And so going into this five-year run between 1998, running up until 2003, under the writing of Peter David, we ended up seeing, you know, this Young Justice roster expand to a degree, but not become overly huge like Teen Titans did. And by the time it was all said and done, really the core characters were Robin, Superboy, Wonder Girl, and Impulse. So with the exception of Cassie Sandsmark, I think it is, or maybe Donna 
of Troy, with the exception of like Wonder Girl being introduced, that was really all there was. I mean, you had the characters and you had crossovers, but in terms of the core roster, it was kept pretty minimal and it was kept pretty small. Now, again, because of the fact that Young Justice was so wildly popular, you know, among the reader base, which rightfully so, <laughs> if I were reading DC back then, I would have been all about Young Justice. But because of the fact that the writing of, of Peter David kind of combined with the nature of the characters really set the stage for just this extremely popular story, DC was running into a position where, pardon my language, it was kind of like, you know, crap or get off the pot. They'd long since been teasing the idea that Bart Allen would replace Wally West. And so because of the fact that Infinite Crisis was designed to basically follow up to, you know, Crisis on Infinite Earths as this kind of 20 year anniversary issue, as well as fix a lot of the continuity uh, issues that still lingered after Crisis on Infinite Earths and had been created after Zero Hour Crisis in Time, DC basically killed off the character of Wally West. They basically removed him from the entirety of the DC landscape. And so what this did is it set the stage for a story called The Flash, Fastest Man Alive, which ran between 2006 and 2009. About five or six issues into this, according to an interview that was done by Mark Guggenheim, who was writing the story at the time, fans hated it. While they loved the character of Bart Allen, they loved the character of Wally West even more. And for the most part, they'd been allowed to have their cake and eat it too. They'd been allowed to have Wally West as The Flash and Bart Allen as Impulse, both in his own solo series, at least up until it ended, as well as in the Young Justice line of stories. And because of the fact that Bart Allen's line of comics dealt with things like the disappearance of Max Mercury and how he was going to live without his mentor, different things like that, ultimately, fans just kind of felt betrayed a little bit. And so, well, The Fastest Man Alive basically picked up in the aftermath of Infinite Crisis, which is to say, you know, Bart Allen entering the Speed Force and then coming out as an adult. This ended pretty fast. And in fact, in the same interview that Mark Guggenheim had done, he had stated that according to DC editorial, as the mandate came down, the larger scope of how it is Flash Fastest Man Alive ended wasn't necessarily important. What was important was that Bart Allen had to die. He had to be killed off at the end of the story. And so Mark Guggenheim basically crafted the end of Flash Fastest Man Alive that essentially saw Bart Allen being killed off by Thaddeus Thawne, more or less. Now, of course, this ran into the beginning of Jeff John's run on The Flash, if not maybe a little bit before, and it ultimately resulted in Wally West coming back, his kids being aged up, Wally learning that Bart Allen had been killed by Thaddeus, and then just kind of sitting Thaddeus in this stasis whereby time moved incredibly slow for him, you know, like thousands of years would pass, so on and so forth. Now, within DC Comics, the death of Bart Allen was actually handled pretty tastefully, you know, there were, you know, kind of like a candlelight vigil, different things like that that went on, but for the most part, a lot of the immediate aftermath focused on Wally West and the fact that he felt like he had failed. The Kid Flash, he had his own, you know, protege for the most part, and his attempt to basically keep, you know, Bart Allen safe had ultimately failed when he had taken off with regards to, uh, to the, you know, future of the story and, you know, so on and so forth and how he ended up playing his role. And so Bart Allen actually returned during the events of uh, Final Crisis, Legion of Three Worlds, I think it was. And it was really kind of like this shoehorned explanation in the sense that it was basically some lightning rod or something along those lines that had basically given him his powers back. But it also brought back Connor Kent's Superboy, who would also die. Now, of course, this is a way for DC to grab the characters, roll them back in. And in truth, I would say a lot of this was done because of the fact that if making Bart Allen the Flash was very distasteful to fans and DC decided to kill him off, the best thing to do was to grant a reprieve. The Flash sales aren't doing as well as they used to. We tried to shift things up with Bart Allen. Fans didn't like it. So let's see if we can just rework it in its entirety. And so Barry Allen coming back, basically retaking his mantle as the Flash, the entire history of his character being rewritten by Jeff Johns and Flash Rebirth, all these things going on basically sort of cleared the air. It was essentially grabbing all these pieces, this huge muddled mess, clearing it all up and then throwing it all back out there in a way that was more concise and was more cohesive. And so the result was that Bart Allen was basically sent back to his younger form and he became Kid Flash once again. Now, this saw him running through a handful of stories, but the popularity he achieved in the Impulse line of stories between the mid 1990s running all the way up into the early 2000s and the end of Young Justice, he never really achieved that level of popularity again. This ran up until about 2011 when DC rebooted with a new 52. The problem with the rebooted version of Bart Allen is instead of him being called Bart Allen, he was called Bartor. And instead of him basically being this young kid who was trying to understand his place in the world, that relatability was replaced with the fact that he was just basically some guy from the future who was like a religious fundamentalist fanatic or something like that. And so because DC had effectively turned him into a religious zealot slash terrorist, fans hated it. This was coming off the heels of the fact that fans didn't like the Teen Titans the way it had been organized in the New 52. There was really no chance for Bart Allen to survive with regards to his character being popular. And so over the course of the whole Teen Titans run, really running up until like issues 25 and 26 when he was given a new origin, as well as the end of the Teen Titans stories, ultimately he was just kind of sent back into the future and he was put in jail for the crimes that he committed and that was really about it. Now because of the fact that DC Rebirth is designed for the purpose of essentially trying to wipe the slate clean,
clean, quote unquote, and to basically say not everything that happened in the new 52 was still intact, that we're basically getting rid of the things that you guys don't like, and we're keeping the things that you do like. The reboot never really took place. Instead, it was Manhattan just modifying 10 years out of everybody's mind. What this does is it sets the stage for DC to basically say the version of Bart Allen that you saw in the new 52, that, is, that doesn't exist. Just pretend like it never happened. And not many fans will complain about that. You know, in fact, the way it seems to indicate Bart Allen is just still in the future. We don't really know what's going on with this character. We don't really know how he fits in to the pre new 52 landscape. We don't know how those dots connect. But what we do know is that by virtue of Super Sons of Tomorrow, the history still seems to be intact. And the character as he's most fondly remembered by fans still seems to be there. It's just a matter of finding a way to connect the version that fans remember to the versions that we see now. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, hopefully this guy is, this gives you guys a pretty good understanding of, of Bart Allen. Definitely an interesting character. I mean, he's, I would say, aside from Wally West, he's probably the most interesting version of the Flash who's out there, just in terms of like the nature of his personality, different things like that. I mean, in truth, all the members of the Flash family bring something cool to the table. I always thought uh, Jay Garrick was probably the coolest version of the Flash. Old Man Flash, he was always one of my favorite versions. But anyway, guys, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and bring this to an end, and I will catch you all later. Peace.